All right. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Hello there. All right. We all made it. Nobody's <laughs> muted. We're uh, at 100% Zoom efficiency. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, we're also at 95% humidity. <laughs> yeah, we are at 95% humidity. Well, you know, we have, a, tonight. we have a program anyway for everyone. Um, yeah, if you're wondering what we're talking about, uh, and you were looking out the window and you live here in the Bay Area, you were probably thinking, oh, what a great night for virtual telescope viewing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all of those things are true, except it is really humid today. And you probably noticed it if you were outside. And uh, no exception here at the Chabot Space and Science Center, where our humidity is now 10% uh, above the uh, uh, limit that we've imposed on opening the roof of the uh, telescope. So you can see behind me is our 36-inch uh, research reflector, uh, fondly known as Nelly. And uh, that is the telescope we use when we are able to open the dome and show you uh, uh, live views of the sky. Uh, but tonight, we've got other programs. But before we get started, uh, I do want to remind everyone that the Chabot Space and Science Center is closed and uh, will be reopening uh, in the fall. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, it's only available for special events and uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to ramp up for public access on Friday and Saturday nights again. But anyhow, we're going to keep you informed here on what the status is of our uh, calendar and what the exact dates of our reopening will be. Uh, in the meantime, we appreciate your donations. If you're on Facebook, you'll notice that there's a fat donate button somewhere on your screen. and uh, uh, if you're so inclined, uh, we would approach, uh, appreciate any donation you can make. I also want to thank Fremont Bank, who has been incredibly generous uh, over the last year, year and a half, uh, with donations to Chabot and are the sponsors of uh, this virtual telescope program. So a uh, big hand to Fremont Bank, and thanks from yeah, all of us. And if you're not on, on Facebook, you can also go to the Chabot uh, Space and Science Center website that's uh, shabospace.org and you'll see a donate button at the top of the page there uh, that thank uh, you that works too yeah thank you sometimes i'm a little bit facebook centric and i forget <laughs> that there's other people out there all right uh we've got something special tonight something that's usually done as a different program, but we're combining it with the virtual telescope program tonight. So Gerald, why don't you uh, tell everyone what it is we're gonna be doing? And- uh, All right, okay. so every month we do a program, we normally do it on Friday nights uh, called The Sky This Month. And it's a little video that tells you a little bit about the constellations that are in the sky uh, each month and a little bit of background about that. It's uh, narrated, produced, and often narrated by uh, Don Saito, who is uh, a longtime Chabot volunteer, and he's pretty good with uh, doing that editing stuff. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and see if I can find that video. Uh, Let's see, computer sound. Yes, all right. And I think we got it. There we go. Okay, so here is Don Saito and the sky tonight. Greetings, fellow Earthlings. With the COVID-19 pandemic winding down, we still are looking forward to being able to meet in person inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center. We will be open to the public in six months from now, November 2021. Until then, we can always use Nature's Planetarium, also known as the real sky, to step outside, tilt our heads back, and see at least some of the amazing things I'll be pointing out for you tonight. I am, of course, talking about the constellations. There are people, animals, and objects up in the night sky. They've been there for millennia, but most people are unaware of them as they glide by unnoticed, right over our heads every clear night. Tonight, let us explore these objects and characters and let them become our friends and familiars, just as the ancients did. To start, let's consider the reason we don't see all the constellations at once. The Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. 
Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's yearly orbital path around the Sun. I want you to think about that for a moment. The constellations have seasons too. Just realizing this, fully, can help make knowing the constellations easier. We can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night which changes our view of the stars as the Earth makes its orbit around the Sun throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, and if the Moon isn't too bright, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully. But most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass using a star grouping that is quite easy to see and most everyone knows, the Big Dipper. If you don't know the Big Dipper, has someone who does know it pointed out to you. Around this time of the year, the Dipper is kind of sideways, but is still easy to see with its curving handle and bowl. Take special note of the two stars at the end of the bowl. These are called the pointers because if you take the distance between them and extend that distance out about five times their length, they point to this semi-bright star here. Now, Polaris is the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is, so no matter what time of night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is of course an illusion caused by the Earth's rotation, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact it is the Earth that's spinning. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's north polar axis straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, a small constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of its bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Starting between the bowls of the Big and Little Dippers, Arcing up and over the Little Dipper, you find the tail of Draco the Dragon. He's also got feet, a short belly, and a long neck and squarish head. There be dragons up there. I'll bet you didn't know that, but now you do. Now, you probably didn't notice that I called the Little Dipper, also known as Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, a constellation, while earlier I called the Big Dipper a star grouping. Isn't the Big Dipper a constellation too? Nope, the Big Dipper is what we astronomers call an asterism, which is different from an actual constellation. The Big Dipper is only part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Big Bear, as seen here. He's totally upside down from this view, but here's what he looks like right side up. As you can see, the end of the so-called Big Dipper's handle is his nose. The Dipper's curving handle is the back of his neck, and the dipper's bowl is like a saddle on the bear's back. Got it? Good. To continue, let's turn our view to the south like so. This will flip everything we've seen so far upside down, or right side up depending on how you look at it, and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. We can use the Big Dipper's handle to find two other constellations, the Otis the Herdsman and Virgo the Virgin. All you have to do is follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle until you reach the bright star Arcturus, which is in the lap of Bootes. If you saw his name spelled out, you'd want to pronounce it Booties, but it's Bootes. He's got a big head, a cap, a body in a sitting position with a leg and foot, and his pipe. A simple shepherd smoking his pipe while watching over his flock. And to find the next constellation, just continue that arc in order to speed on to Spica, which happens to be part of Virgo, the Virgin. So, follow the arc to Arcturus, and then speed on to Spica. How nice! Virgo is our first zodiacal constellation for June. There are several other zodiacal constellations up at this time of the year, 
but they're so faint I'm afraid pointing them out would be wasted effort, so I won't. Most of Virgo's stars are pretty faint, and her overall shape is pretty rough as an approximation of a woman lying down, but she has a head, one arm pointing up, a body, two legs, and of course, her shiny rump star, which is Spica. Arcing above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where all the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic, and is also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology, most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work, we are in their debt. To the right, or west of Virgo, we have our other worthy zodiacal constellation, Leo the Lion. He's got a head, neck with mane, body, legs, and tail. Located in his front foot, Leo's brightest star is called Regulus, which is the 22nd brightest star in the sky. He's heading toward the west, and by next month will be pretty much impossible to see, so see him while you can, before he's lost to the sun's glare. Going back to Boötes, the herdsman, just behind his head is a pretty little constellation, Corona Borealis, the northern crown, with a semi-bright jewel in the middle, Gemma. Using the tips of the northern crown as pointers, we find the keystone of Hercules, an asterism that is his head, with the rest of his body, limbs, and club seen thusly. Trailing behind Hercules, we see Lyra, the lyre, which is a small Greek harp and not someone who tells untruths. It contains one of the brightest stars in the sky, Vega, the first star to show of the asterism, the Summer Triangle, which we will see in the early evening of next month. Or, if you can't wait, stay up until around midnight and the Earth will roll enough for you to see it now. And that's it. There are other smaller or fainter constellations out there which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them by the author H.A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts were drawn. The astro scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for convenience, they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $18. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars that are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned! There are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us all very happy. And until we meet again, we'll see you in the future! Hey, thank you, Don. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs>
I get a kick out of that every time. <laughs> <laughs> In the he, future. He, he likes that echo effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he does. So anyway, that gives you an idea of some of the, the constellations that are up in the sky. Um, for those of you just tuning in, uh, the reason we're not looking through the telescope is our humidity is up around 95%, 96%, something like that, which is way too high for us to operate our telescopes. Got some fog rolling in over the bay right now, and it's probably going to work its way up here to the Shimo Space and Science there before too long. Um, but... Um, We'll, we will do this every every week until we uh, get good weather, and then we'll actually start operating the telescope. Could be worse. Bob says it's raining up there in Oregon, yeah, on the so, Oregon yeah. coast. So, well, so so Richard, we had a question that came up uh, on I think it was on Facebook about um, why we're waiting so long right. to open. Uh, you might want to address that a little bit more. Yes. Um, so the question was. <clears throat> Is the re <clears throat> pardon me? Is the reopening of Chabot delayed until November because of the installation of the new NASA educational program? And could the Chabot Visitor Center be reopened this summer for fully vaccinated folks? Thank you. Um, good question, Stephen. And uh, one of the things he mentions in there is the new NASA educational program. So that some of you who are listening may know about this, but I'll bet most of you don't. Um, the Chabot Space and Science Center is now an official NASA Visitor Center, and uh, we're going to be partnering with NASA Ames for new exhibits on a uh, fairly frequent basis. Uh, there are several of the uh, space artifacts that are stored at NASA Ames that are going to be moved over to Chabot for display, um, and uh, we're not entirely sure which ones yet, so we're, uh, we're, we have a betting pool going on here on what, what it is uh, that's going to be on display here at Chabot from NASA Ames. But in any case, we're going to have a lot of joint programming with NASA and new exhibits, and it takes time to install all of that stuff. Uh, also, the center has been, you know, closed for over a year, and certain things fall into disrepair when they're not used. So uh, right now, we've got uh, uh, teams going through the center, uh, identifying uh, what parts of the center need to be repaired. There's construction work going on in the main building to open up more space for the exhibits. And all of this takes time. And it, we, we need the time uh, between now and the fall to get it all together uh, for uh, reopening to the public. Um, it may be possible that some of our uh, special uh, EAS programs may uh, open up uh, earlier. Uh, there's been some talk about that, but nothing definitive yet. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean we're we're not doing anything up here. We That's are having true. having some events, uh, some rental events that we've had. They're very small scale events, uh, weddings. Uh, we had a small Girl Scout group up here last night, so we are doing some things with our telescopes, but uh, it's strictly uh, the the rental type events. We're not opening to the public yet. That'll come later on in the fall. We are looking forward to a, a members viewing night too. If you're a member of Chabot, we're, we're hoping to get one of or a couple of those maybe in the next few months uh, set up. Yeah. Uh, well, I, hope that answer, I hope that answers your question. Um, it, it is a complicated topic because there's a lot going on all at once right now. So uh, we'll keep all of you informed and, as, and as programs come changing. up. Yeah, and the rules keep changing that, that too, <laughs> is exactly. All right. Um, so, so, Richard, I wanted to share something here. Uh, you and I talked about it a little bit beforehand. Uh, yeah. um, right now, there's a spacecraft, uh, a lander on Mars. It's called InSight. And InSight uh, was the, the space mission before the Mars 2020 space mission. So InSight was launched in 2018. And it's a spacecraft that's on the surface of Mars, but it's not a rover. It's a stationary uh, spacecraft. And it has a couple of functions. And I'm gonna share some pictures here with you just to give you an idea of what, what we're talking about. This is an artist's view of the InSight spacecraft on the ground in Mars. Um, it is there for a couple purposes. One of them was to install this device here, which is a seismometer, 
which would allow them to uh, record Mars quakes and even impacts on Mars and things like that. The other thing is this thing here called the mole, which the plan was that this would drive a spike deep into the ground, which they could then use to measure the temperature, the subsurface temperature. The mole has not worked out very well. It turns out the ground is a lot harder than they thought. Uh, the seismometer, seismometer, though, has been put out. Um, but this is a nice pristine view of the spacecraft, um, like on day one of that mission. And you see these two big panels here. These are the solar cells, which are used to power the spacecraft. Um, those solar cells charge batteries every day. Uh, and over time, they get dust accumulating on them. So I've, I've got a picture here. I got to get you guys out of the way before I can move on to the next I'll, picture. I'll duck. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. so this is actual an actual live image, or not a live Im an image taken by the spacecraft wow. on Mars. You can see the seismometer out there. Uh, you can also see the little robot arm that it has on top of it. Um, and you notice it's got some dust on it. And over time, because the wind does blow on Mars, you get a very fine, fine layer of dust that builds up on the spacecraft. And it builds up on those uh, solar panels and makes them less efficient. And uh, so at, over a period of time, the amount of uh, power that they can get out of those solar panels slowly degrades. To make matters worse, Mars's orbit is very elliptical around the sun. And right now, Mars is nearing the point where it is farthest from the sun. So it's getting even less sunlight than, than it would say when it's at what we call perihelion, which is when it's closest to the sun. So those two things are combining to result in a loss of power. It's still working, but it doesn't have quite as much power as they'd like it to have. And, and one of the problems is, again, all this dust that's accumulating. And you can see here, there's, there's the, uh, the current view of those solar panels. And, and you can see it's completely covered with dust. And so, uh, the, uh, the the folks down at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab who are operating the spacecraft, they started to become concerned and started wondering what can we do to get rid of some of that dust on those solar panels. Now, ordinarily what happens is periodically you get a little windstorms on Mars or you get dust devils on Mars. And if they pass over the spacecraft, they actually clean off a lot of the dust from those solar panels. But that hasn't happened for a while. And so they decided to come up with something more creative. There's a, an engineer at, at NASA JPL, his name is Matt Gollumbeck. And some of you may remember him. He's been around for a long time, uh, back with the, when the first rover landed on Mars back in 1990, uh, 97, I believe it was. Uh, he, he got a lot of attention. He was uh, interviewed quite often and he's still around. And he came up with a really cool idea. So this is the, the, the robot arm. It has a scoop on it. The dust that's on the surface here is very, very fine. And his idea was, gee, once in a while the wind does blow, why don't we pick up some of the dirt from the ground, which is much coarser material than that fine dust on the uh, solar panels, hold it up and then drop that dirt in the wind so that the dirt particles blow across the surface of the solar panels and see if that doesn't actually brush away some of that uh, fine dust. So I've got another image here, uh, I think. Yeah, here, here you go. Here's, here's the scoop. Here's the edge of the solar panels. And what I'm going to do now is share, so I'm going to stop this share, and I'm going to share the result of that uh, concept here. Maybe I'm going to share it. There we go. 
Uh, is this it? Yep, this is it right here. So here you go. Here's a series of images showing what happened. So the scoop starts out. You see there's dirt in it. They drop the dirt down here, actually, onto this part of the spacecraft. It blows in the wind, and it blows the, the, the dirt particles blowing across the panel actually removes some of the dust. So if you look right here, you'll see that some of that dust got blown away. Now you look at this and you think, oh, that's not very good. But this actually yielded a 38 watt increase in the amount of power that they were getting uh, from their solar panels. So a crazy idea dump more dirt on the spacecraft and you remove the dust. So I just thought that was pretty cool that they came up with that. You know, It is really clever. Don't try this at home. If you have like a dusty house, don't like throw around a bunch of dirt and expect it to be cleaner. But it works I was Mars. hoping I could yeah. clean my house that way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, very good. That's really interesting. So there was something else that happened uh, uh, this week. Uh, there was a solar eclipse. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was a uh, I, I don't know anybody who saw it uh, because uh, uh, it was not visible at all from the West Coast of the United States. It was partially visible uh, as a partial solar eclipse uh, in the East Coast, the Northeast uh, United States. And it was a annual annular eclipse, meaning the uh, uh, sun forms what's called a ring of fire because the moon is uh, it, it, apparent size is slightly smaller than the sun. It was a uh, total annular eclipse if you were up in like New Brunswick uh, and were doing work up in the Arctic. And I'll show you a map. I saw it from my house in northern Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you were. We were looking for you and we couldn't find you. Hold on. I'm going to bring up um, an image here. Bear with me of what this eclipse path looked like. Here we go. So things get kind of funny on these uh, far northern or far southern eclipse. It's almost, you know, it's, it's a little tricky to read these maps and it's a little counterintuitive to understand the path of the eclipse. But the eclipse actually started uh, here, uh, in the maximum uh, uh, eclipse started here uh, in Ontario. And uh, the shadow uh, went from uh, east to west uh, over the pole, and uh, Is that going eventually, west to east. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's 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 going. No, east yeah, west. it's. Yeah, so, it's, the yeah. pole is the pole is right here. So I guess if you're standing on this side, <laughs> like I said, the geometry gets oh, a little okay. confusing, <laughs> right? Right. So um, normally you would think as the eclipse is going, you know, uh, well, anyway, and there is no normally if you're at the pole. So uh, in any case, uh, there was there were some good views of it from uh, the uh, eastern United States, and I do have only one photograph of the uh, total eclipse. <laughs> Usually when we have an eclipse, there's like a zillion photographs on the internet, right? The internet is like this massive resource of eclipse photographs, but not for this one, because I guess there just aren't a lot of people uh, <laughs> photographing eclipses up in the, you know, the Arctic. And uh, so this one was a little bit harder to find images of. Um, and give me a sec here, and I'll bring up the two that I think I can show you without getting into any copyright violations. Um, I really don't want to get that um, that uh, uh, notice from anybody. <laughs> Hold on, bear with me. All right, and I will now share this. Okay, this is uh, gives you a good idea of what an annular eclipse looks like. And this one is from a photographer named uh, Elliot Herman. And uh, he was able to see the uh, full eclipse uh, over Ontario and posted this photograph. Um, and another photograph that has been posted uh, by NASA. Uh, let me see if I can get to it from here. I may have to share that one separately. So again, bear with me. I'll stop my share. And
There we go. And uh, this one, uh, I don't have to worry about copyright. It's a NASA image. And uh, this is the uh, US Capitol and the sun rising in uh, eclipse. Uh, they would not have seen it as a total eclipse uh, from DC, but uh, it was uh, visible as a partial eclipse right at sunrise. And I thought that was a pretty uh, remarkable photograph. So that's that. That was our eclipse. Um, we've had a couple of eclipses in the last uh, month. We had a total lunar eclipse here in the West Coast and then uh, this solar eclipse. And I don't think there's any more eclipses this year, guys. There we go. No, I think you're, you're right. I think there's no more. Yeah, we'll have to wait till next year. Interesting question from Larry. How did they get a picture of the black hole using only radio telescopes? Ah. Um, the, the gas around the black hole emits radio waves um, and by by using combining the the uh, radio uh, images from several different observatories around the world uh, they were able to get a very high resolution image uh, the, the color that you see in that photo the, that famous photo of the black hole is actually artificially generated uh, so what they do is they uh, they combine the the radio images from all these different observatories, uh, go through a lot of processing, and produce a fairly high resolution image of of the black hole. Yeah, you oh. can you can yeah. see that uh, the image on the right is the one that he's referring to, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, you know with radio telescopes, of course, you're not looking at visible light. You uh, have to convert the data to uh, a representation, and so uh, you know they this is if you assign colors to different frequencies um, and uh, uh, brightness to different densities, uh, you end up with an image that looks like this. So uh, Bob Schock uh, mentioned something that I wanted to talk about. Um, there's another spacecraft out there called Juno. Juno has uh. been orbiting around uh, uh, Jupiter. <laughs> My, my mind drew a blank there for a second. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Juno has been orbiting around uh, Jupiter for quite a while. And I'm going to see if I can share this. They recent, it recently got very close to the moon Ganymede. Ganymede is the largest of Jupiter's moons. In fact, it is the largest moon in the solar system. And it was able to get some pretty close up images of Ganymede. Ganymede is covered with kind of a dirty ice uh, layer. And so it does uh, get uh, craters in it, but those craters don't last very long. The surface keeps getting reworked because there's so much ice in the surface. Uh, but this was one of the better images that we've had. We've had uh, images of Ganymede from previous missions, but this is a much better high resolution image from, from Juno. Um, and this just came down just a few days ago. Um, and it's always interesting to see these images coming from Juno. Uh, given the fact that when the, the spacecraft was originally <laughs> proposed, there was no camera as part of the proposed instrumentation. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really ironic because it yeah. has sent back the most uh, dramatic oh, yeah. photos really, of yeah. Jupiter yeah. and, and Jupiter's some... moons of any spacecraft that we've sent. Um, I, I really like that photograph because... Um, you know, when I first saw it, you know, I, I end up flipping through photographs every day, whatever comes over the news or is on Facebook or whatever. And I, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, somebody posted a moon moon picture. <laughs> yes. And, and it was thing. like, and I, and I just thumbed right past it. And then something in the back of my head said, wait a second. <laughs> wait a minute. Those craters are all wrong. That did not look right. <laughs> and I, I went back and realized what it was I was looking at. But it, it is remarkable how the uh coloration and just the overall uh, types of features that you see uh, resemble our own moon so much you know even though even though a lot of it is is caused by ice 
on Ganymede, you still have, you know, what look like Mare, and you still have the craters, and you still have the same types of grayscale uh, coloration that you see on our own moon. And one of the cool things about uh, Ganymede, it is a really big moon. It's about 3,000 miles in diameter, so it's bigger than our moon. If Ganymede was orbiting the sun instead of Jupiter, Ganymede would be a planet. Right. Um, Can you put that photograph back up for a sec? Because uh, oh, Bob was uh, point, Bob Shock was pointing something out on that photo, and I want to yeah, I want to see it. Hang, hang on here. Let me uh, yeah, stop doing that and <laughs> get back here. Bring up the image. Download the image. Find the share button. <laughs> <laughs> Too many steps. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there you go. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is what he was talking about. So on the if you on the left hand side, uh, towards the middle, there's oh, yeah. a crater inside of a crater. Right. There. It's almost right like there. somebody hit the bullseye <laughs> with exactly. the second with the second <laughs> impact. If it, assuming that it's it's a multiple impact crater that 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 we're looking at because it well, could this, be this that it's actually a fresh crater right there. I was gonna yeah, say there's it, another it crater be, inside a crater there. Yeah, it could be that that's a single event, and it's just the nature of the erosion of the uh, central pile that causes that effect. Mm. Because if you see all these other craters, they all have this same bullseye. Right? Yeah. And unless unless and somebody has got really good aim out there. Right, it's so perfectly <laughs> centered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That might be because, you know, again, this is a lot of ice. So maybe some something to do with the fact uh -huh. that it's got ice and it, it gets those little bullseyes in the center. Huh. I mean, you, you can see, if you look carefully, you can see all the wrinkles in the ice here. Right. Um, you know, as, as uh, Jupiter, or I'm, I'm sorry, as Ganymede orbits around Jupiter, Jupiter's very strong gravity flexes the moon. Uh, it's, its orbit is not a perfect circle, so sometimes it's a little closer, sometimes it's a little farther away. When it's closer, Jupiter's gravitational pull pulls on it a little harder, and there's actually a difference between how strong the gravity is on one side, the side facing Jupiter, versus the side, the opposite side of the, of the moon. So that causes Ganymede to be stretched a little bit. And then as it orbits around, it moves away from Jupiter, it relaxes a little bit. So it's constantly going through this little stretching and release, stretch and release. And that produces all these wrinkles that you see here. Really interesting. Oh, we got corrected by um, uh, by Bobby, who's a viewer tonight. Uh, there is one other total eclipse this yeah. year. There's a total solar eclipse over Antarctica on December 4th. So get your tickets now. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I bet you we're not going to have a ton of photos from that one either. No, we probably won't. But um, often there are um, uh, jet trips to view Antarctica solar eclipses that take off from uh, like Buenos Aires and uh, uh, you could take a, a plane to view the eclipse and hopefully you get a window seat. Oh, well, here's an interesting question um, <laughs> from little V. She wants to know how many Ganymedes would it take to uh, fill the Jupiter's hmm. red spot? Well, I don't know. I'd have to think of that one about. Yeah, that's a um, tough yeah, the one. The red spot is bigger than the Earth, so right, right. Actually, actually, now it's about the same size as the Earth. Um, so probably, I would say half dozen. Yeah, half dozen or so. Yeah, yeah half dozen. We're gonna go with a half dozen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Correct us if we're wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If somebody else wants to do the math uh, to correct us, please be, <laughs> be our guest. Um, but I, that seems like a good rough estimate. All right. Do we have any other questions tonight? Uh, there is one. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why he's asking this. Uh, Jim asks, would you please define gas and dust? I guess there's some some doubt as to exactly what kind of gas and dust we're talking about. Yeah, gas is individual uh, molecules or atoms drifting around. 
Uh, dust is where you take those molecules and atoms and you combine them together to create a particle. And so that's, that's a dust particle. Uh, so if you imagine, for example, uh, carbon dioxide gas, carbon dioxide is a molecule. It's two oxygen atoms connected to a carbon atom. Um, and if you have those individual molecules drifting around, you have a gas. Uh, but if you have, you know, carbon dioxide molecule and uh, a nitrogen molecule and, and a bunch of other different molecules and they all stick together somehow, so they're, they're different molecules all stuck together, eventually you have a dust particle. And so that's the, the, the major difference is, is individual atoms or molecules floating to around versus something that's made up of a combination of many different molecules. Right. All right. Uh, what else have we got here tonight for questions? Have you checked, uh, see if anybody's asking anything on YouTube? I'm, uh, I'm YouTube. Checking. Yeah. Uh, okay. Someone asked about meteor showers. Yes, we have a meteor shower coming <laughs> up uh, in August. We have the uh, Perseid meteor shower. Right. Uh, that's around August 12th, I believe it is, the night of August 12th into the 13th. But don't quote me on that. It may be the morning of August 12th. Um, I'll have to look that up. Um, and that's one of the better meteor showers of the mm -hmm. year. And we're not going to have a whole lot of moon this year. So it's going to be a really good night to, to view meteor showers if we don't get fogged out. <laughs> so. Now, the, be the best way to view a meteor shower is uh, not with a telescope. Because telescope's pretty useless for a meteor shower. Right. So uh, the most important uh, uh, accessories for viewing a meteor shower are a comfortable chair and a pot of hot coffee and maybe a blanket or two yeah and a blanket or two you want to stay warm mm -hmm. um and then uh, as the radiant of the uh, meteor shower which is the point at which the meteors seem to emanate from uh, as the radiant rises higher in the sky you turn your chair pretty much in that direction and you can watch the meteors uh fly across the sky it's pretty cool if it's a if it's a good year for it um it's a pretty dramatic event um the perseids are uh known to have fairly bright meteors and in f fairly numerous uh the other one that is really well known are the leonids which happen uh several months geminids. later yeah and, and the geminids right but the yeah. the leonids uh tend to be high volume but not big and and uh, and and bright. Um, so yeah, so it's the Perseids, the Geminids, and the Leonids are the three big ones usually for that we can hope to see in the Bay Area. But, hey, Mario, Mario asked a question on yeah. YouTube. Uh, he says, "Are all partial moons actually lunar eclipses?" I think he might be talking about the phases, phases of moons yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. And and the answer is, if that's what you're talking about, Mario, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Actually, the phases of the moon are caused by the angle between the sun, the moon, and the Earth. As the moon orbits around the Earth its angle relative to the sun changes. So sometimes we're seeing only half the moon lit by the sun uh, because basically it's a 90 degree angle between the sun, the moon and the earth. Uh, when we have a full moon, the earth and the sun, or I'm sorry, the sun, the earth and the moon are all lined up so that uh, the moon is 180 degrees from where the sun is as viewed from the earth. So it's just a matter of where the moon is relative to the sun and the earth that determines the phases of the moon. Lunar eclipses only happen periodically uh, and it doesn't even look the same as what the phases look like. So, uh, so the answer is, to your question is no. 
Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I always think of it that, you know, during any during a lunar eclipse, the uh, moon is in the Earth's shadow. And during the phases of the moon, the moon is in its own shadow. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, so. it's just, just like the Earth has a day and a night side, the moon has a day and a night side. And as the moon orbits around the Earth, what, what part of the moon is day and what part is night changes each each day. And so depending on how we are viewing the moon, at what angle the sun is, that determines the phases. Uh, Bobby asks a question that we get all the time in this kind of weather. Why can't the telescopes be used in high humidity if you can still see the stars in a clear sky? Well, it's because the, the humidity is really bad for the telescopes. The, it uh, deposits it actually the the moisture condenses on the cold parts of the telescope and the optics and it deposits dirt there and then uh, mm -hmm. then we have to clean and and wear the the telescopes down a little bit and that's really bad for them yeah it's not easy to clean these big mirrors it's a it's a pretty major effort and whenever water droplets form it just leaves behind a lot of dirt and that lowers the reflectivity of the mirror for future viewings so we have to we have to take that uh, humidity limit fairly seriously. All right, I see somebody has uh, um, not so much corrected me, but verified it is the morning of August twelfth that oh, the, great. the meteor shower uh, peaks. Uh, looks like maybe. Uh, uh, Mary Catherine is is watching. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good. Hi there. Thank you. Us <laughs> Keeping us honest. Keeping us honest, right? <laughs> Make, making sure we do, do our jobs right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, it's the morning of August twelfth. I, I kind of remembered that, but I wasn't one hundred percent sure. Thank uh, you. <laughs> somebody told somebody told a pretty good joke here. I was listening to our whole presentation, obviously, when we were talking about dirt getting onto the uh, mirror. She, uh, Leia said, "Just dump more dirt on." Yeah. All right. Touche. Touche. That's funny. <laughs> Oh, it was Rick. Uh, it wasn't Mary Catherine. Oh, that's right. I gave Rick the login. Oh. Uh, there we go. <laughs> He's able to look official. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so you gave him here's a, here, here we have a we have a physics question here that I'm that I'm trying to absorb. Okay, so I know some of Would it, with a magnetar, so like a magnetism does affect. Would a magnet? Would it, would, so the question is: is is ma, will magnetism, high density of magnetism, affect light path? Hmm. And yeah, magnetism itself, no. No. But yeah. if you're talking about a magnetar, which is a a, yeah. a star, which is producing a very strong magnetic field. Yeah, it's a very massive object, so its yeah, gravitational yeah. field will bend light. Right. So it's not because of the magnetism, it's because of its gravitational field. Just like a black hole or even our own sun causes light to bend, and we've demonstrated that through observations of Mercury uh, while it's orbiting the sun. That was the well, proof that's... of, uh, of uh, gravitation's of effect on light. That's interesting, though, because magnetism can affect light. Uh, think of a, uh, a, a, a v, uh, I'm sorry, a video tube. Yeah, but that's like, like an old television beam. tube. It's yeah, an electron that's an electron beam. beam. It's yeah. an electron beam. You're not. Yeah. Not it doesn't light. turn into light. That's right. It, you've got to you've got to have yeah. more mass involved. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Good question. You're showing your age, John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you still have that Magnavox TV. <laughs> yes. it's, it's a whopping 23 yeah. inch tele yeah. television. Yeah. 550 yeah. lines per inch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah those were the days. No, uh, light has no mass, so gravity does not affect it. It does not affect the light, it affects the space that the light travels in. So it causes space to warp. 
And so the light thinks it's traveling in a straight line if it is able to think about anything. <laughs> right. But the light tra thinks it's traveling in a straight line, but it in fact uh, uh, creates a curve from the observer's perspective because space has been warped uh, uh, midway through the path, which is even weirder. So uh, Larry says when he looks at M13 through through his telescope, all the stars look brown and fuzzy. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that, Larry. <laughs> okay, well let me let me make a couple let me make a couple of suggestions. Um, if they your look, lens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no more dirt. No the uh, the uh, the brown I can't really explain. You may be using too much magnification. It's a mistake that a lot of people make. Uh, mm, when yeah. they uh, use a telescope at first. Start off with your lowest magnification eyepiece. And if you're using uh, like a, you know, a six or eight millimeter eyepiece to look at M13, uh, forget about it. Switch it out with a 20 or a 30 millimeter eyepiece and uh, see what it looks like then. You should be able to bring it into sharp focus. If you still can't bring it into sharp focus, um, and you've tried over a variety of nights, then uh, make sure you can bring the moon into focus. You may have something else going on with the telescope. Uh, M13 tends to focus pretty well as long as you're not using too much magnification. So um, it's very bright. that's my only advice to you. So Colleen asks, what direction do we look for the uh, meteors? Up. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely look up. That's the best answer, yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when we, we say the uh, meteor showers, the Perseids or the Leonids or the Geminids, we're referring to the constellation from which the meteors appear to radiate. However, they streak across the whole sky. So you don't want to just look in that one direction. You want to look at as much of the sky as you can see. The best way to see a meteor shower is to lay a blanket out on, uh, on the ground, lay down and, and get as much of the sky as you can in your field of view. Because although the streak, if you follow the line of the streak backwards, it appears always to come from whatever the radiant constellation is the streak itself can appear in any part of the sky. So you, you, you don't want to fall into the, uh, the uh, habit of looking at the radiant. You want to look sure. at as much of the sky as you can. That's Good. why we say don't use binoculars, don't use a telescope. Uh, you want, want that big picture in order to see the, the meteors. We'll talk right. more about this as we get closer to the. As we get closer, right. we'll have we'll have pictures and diagrams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we had a lot of good questions tonight. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we'll uh, keep it open for a couple more minutes. Yeah. We can't look through the telescope, so all we can do is depend on your questions. So if there's anything else you want to uh, try to ask us, uh, now's the time. And uh, otherwise, we'll. Uh, Give it another shot next week and see how it all works out. Anyone? All right. Yeah, okay. Bob suggests on the focusing, try focusing during the daytime. Yeah. And make oh. sure that you're on a far away object. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be a very distant. But it's got to be a real far away object because sometimes, yeah. sometimes focus problems don't reveal themselves until you are focusing near infinity yeah like like you said the moon is a good target there get it's uh, far always. enough away all right well i think that's it for tonight guys yeah yeah oh, looks sorry. like it is sorry we are not able to look through the telescope well, but it was fun <laughs> anyway colleen mentions a lounge chair when looking at uh, meteors yep. too. that's that's yeah. a great idea absolutely too. that's why, one of the reasons i have a portable lounge chair yep <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Okay. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we will see you we next will do week. We'll see you again next week at 9 30. Absolutely. All right. See you then. Take care. Okay. Have a good weekend. Have a good week. Good night, see everybody. You.